Kia ora. It's a bit of a wild day outside today. I've titled this sermon, Club Think and the Good Samaritan. The conclusion of the book, After Jesus Before Christianity, which surveys the Jesus groups in the first two centuries of the Common Era, is that there was a wide variety of beliefs and practices, experimentation and thought in these groups, with very little in common. What was in common was that people came together to support one another in those troubled times. So they were a friendship club. Or as Hal Telsic says, in reference to their eating together, a supper club. There were lots of clubs around in the ancient world, clubs based on ethnicity, or religion, or occupations, or interests. Friendship in every time and culture needs to find corporate expression, often in clubs and groups. When we think about today and groups that support one another, then we can make a long list. Service clubs, sports clubs, education clubs, cultural clubs, and religious clubs, including churches. The point of difference for the diverse Jesus clubs is that phrase, troubled times. In short, they were non-compliant with the ideology and mythology of the Roman Empire and tried to express their non-compliance in ways that didn't get them killed. So by and large, the wealthy and successful in society in those first two centuries did not join Jesus groups. Those who wanted to get ahead in society, who were happy to be conventional, did not join Jesus groups. Those who were content or profited from the patriarchal and class structure of society wouldn't be found at a Jesus supper club. Those who were attracted to the friendship of Jesus groups were those who didn't fit. And their exemplar was a man who didn't fit and was crucified by the state. And they worshipped the Jewish God who was seen as a weak God, regularly defeated by the superior Roman army. So those who came to a Jesus club were the misfits, the weak, women who'd had enough of patriarchy, men who'd had enough of patriarchy, the enslaved who dared to believe they weren't inferior, the marginal, including the sick who were blamed for being sick. It was such as these that found and gave support to one another. There are groups that exist to support one another in all classes of society, in all ideological and political shapes and sizes. From the words of Mayor Angelou, we know alone, all alone, nobody but nobody can make it out here alone. The difference for the Jesus groups was that they were supporting one another, not just in personal or familial crises, but in developing and holding to a different vision of society that upended the pyramidal policies and practices of the Roman Empire and every empire since, and proclaimed an egalitarian, inclusive justice vision where all were one. Friendship, knowing one another, caring about each other, supporting each other, had this backdrop of an alternative upside-down empire. They called it the kingdom of God that didn't look like any empire or kingdom on offer. There's a well-known children's book by Kate de Goldie called Clubs. It's on our YouTube channel. It's a story about the misfit Lolly, who, like her teacher Miss Love, is not keen on the clubs that existed in her school. They are clubs designed to keep insiders important and outsiders not. 
the goalie is critiquing club think. And that's the trouble with clubs, including church clubs. They can easily become a reflection of those attending, attracting only those who look and think like current attendees, and putting their resources primarily into serving their own group needs. There are, for example, stories you can find on the internet of an American church pastor disguising himself as homeless and turning up at his large middle-class church, only to find himself patronised or shunned. Like the Goldie, such stories, though somewhat trite, are trying to critique clubthink. Yet clubs at their best also give a sense of belonging, camaraderie and purpose. And two of the clubs I belonged to in the past, a ski club and a rotary club, were very good at that. Even Kate de Goldie's a lolly creates a club of sorts for those who don't fit with the conventional clubs on offer. She calls her club the grass-growing spectators club who hang upside down. It's a bit of an alternative kind of book. The challenge for a church is to be a place of support care and friendship for those who come through the doors, while simultaneously in word and deed symbolising its conviction that all who experience exclusion and discrimination, racism, sexism, homophobia, poverty, belong within the alternate vision of society that the church proclaims. So the church is a home, comforting surrounds and friendships, but also a place where uncomfortable others may come and call home. And in a sense, this tension around home and clubthink goes to the heart of the well-known story of the Good Samaritan, our reading this morning. <clears throat> the parable asks, who belongs? In the mind of the lawyer questioning Jesus, the Hebrew scriptures include in belonging those, well, both those who are sons and daughters of our own people, it's a quote from Leviticus and later in the chapter, and the stranger who sojourns with you. So the club can include regulars, the familiar, but also strangers. <clears throat> but Jesus, in this little parable, expands this concept of belonging further, uncomfortably further as he challenges the racism operating here. The neighbour, as the story concludes, is the person moved with pity, who then acts charitably, compassionately, in a costly manner, even when that person, and this is the kicker, is a racial and religious outsider, and frankly, an enemy. This is no ordinary sojourner, wanting to join your club. This is an enemy of the club, caring for a beaten club member whose pain and need has been ignored by other club members. As Brandon Scott says, this parable proposes a new world in which the war between us and them no longer exists. And even more, that one of them can come to the aid of one of us. Identification with characters is an important element in any story. When the man is attacked and left in the ditch half dead, an audience recognises this as a hero's story and awaits the arrival of the hero with whom they will identify. But like an action novel. In a very real sense, they will ride to the rescue of the man in the ditch. When the first Samaritan first approaches, this plan remains in force, and is even reinforced by the similarity of his description to those of the priest and Levite. They were the failed heroes. But when the Samaritan has compassion and takes the beaten man to a Jewish village inn, where, as a Samaritan, he could well himself be beaten by a racist mob. 
this plan is thrown into confusion. And a hero now has three options. Firstly, they could say, in the real world, this would never happen. It's only fiction. Such a hero stays in the same worldview they've always dwelt and reject the parable's opportunity of envisioning life anew. The second option is to identify with the Samaritan. For a hero who wants to stay in the hero's role, there's no alternative. For some in the Jesus audience, this may have been an option. But such people are already different and do not live by the normal values of the Palestinian world of the first century. The third and last option for the hero is to identify with the man in the ditch. If we want to stay in the parable and experience a new world, that's our only available choice. Having begun the parable in the expectation of playing the role of a hero, one ends in the role of the victim, being taken care of by one's mortal and moral enemy. So this is a story that shakes up and messes with boundaries. The inference is, when transposed into the context of church and club, that a member has been beaten up. Some members of the church come by and fail the man in the ditch. Then an outsider, an enemy of to the church club, comes by and saves the member of the club. Salvation has come from an outsider who saves an insider. Likewise, salvation for the whole church might come from those who are outsiders to the whole church. For God is never kept in or out by our boundaries and borders. Indeed, God shakes us up and messes with us. If the lesson from our early forebears is to support one another within the context of a subversive revisioning of how the world might be. The lesson of the Good Samaritan parable is that both compassion and God are not constrained by our unexamined prejudices, but might break in unexpectedly, challenging our revisioning, unsettling what we thought was settled, giving sight where we haven't seen, and sharing wisdom with we who think we're wise already. Blessings to you this week.